Okay, so I'm, I'm really going to only try to talk for 20 minutes, 18 minutes. Uh, there's way too much information to squeeze into this talk. So uh, I'll be around the conference afterwards if you want to ask questions. And we do have a nice little booklet. Uh, and I heard that some of them are coming this way. So if you haven't picked up one of the little red interpretability booklets and you're interested in this kind of stuff, make sure you get one of those. And I think we'll have them here after the talk. OK. So we want to talk about making machine learning models interpretable and do it in 18 minutes. So I'm going to be extremely reductionist. But before we get started, please keep in mind that, that this is a very new, well, in some ways, it's a very new field. Uh, there's no, as far as I know, and I'm privileged enough to be able to talk to some of the leading people in the field fairly regularly, there's no rigorous science of interpretability. Uh, there's very few best practices. There's very few standards on, on what to do. There's a million different interpretability techniques. So the aim of this talk is to help condense some of that information into a set of, of kind of usable practices. So that's what we're going to do. But before we get started, uh, what, what is interpretability? So, I, it's hard to do this when I don't know the audience at all. How many people here use machine learning day to day? OK, that's a good number. That's a good number. So if you use machine learning day to day, you probably know that one of the biggest challenges with using machine learning is its black box nature. Okay? I can get very good predictions, but then when my boss or my regulator or my coworker says, hey, how does that work, you're kind of like, I don't know. You know, it's, it's a black box. We don't ask that. So we want to challenge that. We want to challenge that mindset about machine learning being a black box. That's, that's the basic idea of what we're doing here. We're trying to make machine learning models. We're trying to give practitioners the ability to explain or present in understandable t uh, terms to a human what their machine learning model is doing. That's a very good paper towards a rigorous science of interpretable machine learning. It's very approachable. You can read it on the plane. You can read it on your train ride. It's, it's not even very long. Highly suggest it. The other two links on the slides are um, other groups, so sort of outside H2O, uh, that are leading interpretability research. And so FAT is kind of a funny acronym, but it stands for Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning. And that's a group of academics, uh, legal scholars, sociologists, machine learning people that are kind of collaborating on what interpretability really means. And they have a much more sophisticated definition than I'm showing right now. XAI, explainable AI, that's what DARPA, maybe you're familiar with DARPA. They invented the internet. Uh, DARPA, is, DARPA is also sponsoring research into machine learning interpretability. And they, they go under this acronym XAI, explainable AI. And and you can check out their website, too. They have a very good description of what they consider to be interpretable machine learning. OK. So why, why would you even care? Why would you be here wanting to learn about interpretable machine learning? I think there's a lot of reasons. And, and sort of the most fundamental basic reason is these weak artificial intelligence or machine learning decision-making systems, I don't think they're going to get any less common. right? I think, in fact, they're going to get more common, and they're going to be making more and more decisions for us. So someday in the future, when you know, my kid gets rejected from college, or um, you know, somebody in my family gets sent to jail, and they, and they do actually use machine learning and sentencing decisions today in the United States of America, uh, you know, we're going to want to know why. You know, it's, it's different. Like if, if my iPhone is just giving me songs that I like, you know, that's great. But when these, when these systems start making more and more impact on our day-to-day -day lives, people are going to want to know how they work. And people are going to want to tell each other about them. And especially when they go wrong, people are going to want to understand them. Right? So I think that's the most fundamental uh, driver of why you should care about this. Uh, the commercial driver of this is basically uh, we want to enable businesses in highly competitive, 
regulated, lucrative industries to be able to use machine learning. And to do that, we have to make it explainable because it's a legal mandate and it's just the way they do business. So that's kind of the commercial driver of this. OK, so how do we do machine learning interpretability? I don't have time to tell you. But uh, the, this slide says there's basically a lot of different ways. OK, there's a lot of different ways that people can do machine learning interpretability. Uh, machine learning models are no longer black boxes. There's plenty of techniques that you can use to explain your models. Now, I'm not saying they're all good, and that's what the next slides are about, to kind of give you some hints about what we think is a good way to do this. Uh, but, but basically, as of today, I don't, you know, there's just hundreds, if not thousands, of different techniques that people use to interpret their models, and some of the most prominent of which are on this slide. OK, so now I'm going to go, I'm going to do these nine tips, right? And I'm just going to do them fast to try to stay on schedule. And it, like I said, if you have kind of clarification questions, maybe we can handle those during the talk. But if not, just come see me afterwards. OK. So I think, you know, I started, I tried to start kind of the most general, most important, and then go to more specific ones. So sensitivity analysis is what I call this idea of, let's say my model was trained on a training set where the highest income that it saw was, say, $500,000. And we're trying to predict whether someone's going to pay back their credit card. It would be very, very prudent for me to see what my model says when it sees an income of $20 million. Does it just go off the cliff, like in this picture? Or does it actually do what I think it's going to do? There's no way to do this unless you test it explicitly. You simulate a row of data, and you put a $20 million income in there, and you run it back through your model. If you are switching from linear models to machine learning, uh, linear models extrapolate linearly, okay? So you know what it's going to do when it sees an income of $20 million. You have no idea what your machine learning model is going to do if it sees an income of $20 million unless you've tested it explicitly. And I think that's a very, very important point, and I encourage everyone to do that. Now, there's another thing on the slide, random data attack. And that's a technique that we use at H2O to test our software. And I think it's also really smart. It's not so much about um, numerical accuracy, but it's kind of like, what does my decision system do when it sees the letter K when it's expecting to see the number 20, right? I just expose my model or my application to random data over and over and over again and see what kind of havoc it creates. And it's a way to harden your decision-making systems. Also a good idea. OK. So as I was kind of hinting at earlier, not all, all explanatory software is the same quality. And this is something we've kind of learned the hard way from interacting with our customers and from building software around this ourselves. So if you're going to use some of this open source or even homemade or you know, your friend made it explanatory software, you should test it, OK? Because most of the explanation generating processes are somewhat approximate, and some people do a better job of dealing with the approximate nature of this than others. And the academic literature kind of puts forward the, the best way to test this is if the human beings that are using your explanations think that they're good explanations. That's hard for you know, commercial data mining groups to, to put together some kind of human test, so we've put, we've put together some other suggestions of how you might test your explanations. And the simplest one is I just have a signal generating function in a data set that I know because I'm, I made the data set, I generated the data set, and then I test my explanations to make sure they reflect that signal generating function. So that's, that's the first paragraph. Um, the next point is test your explanations for stability. If I have a row of data and I perturb it slightly, it, it's a bad thing if the explanations change dramatically. Okay. And then the, the bottom point here is if you have, you know, access to Equifax or Experian reason codes or you have reason codes at your company that you trust, you can use those as a baseline and sort of try to make your model more and more accurate but making sure you're still generating the correct explanations. Okay. So I really wanted to run up and hug the person on stage that said, you know, data scientists don't make any money for your company. In fact, they lose money until your model is deployed. 
So that's, I'm just kind of reiterating that. And then when I want to do explanations, that's essentially another piece of software I have to get deployed, okay? So something like the open source Lime package in Python, very, very difficult to deploy. It involves simulating data and training a model during the scoring phase of your application. That doesn't make much sense. So you need to think about from the beginning how you're going to, just like how you would deploy your model and your model predictions, how are you going to deploy your explanations? And I don't have any good answers there except go by driverless AI. Okay. All right. So number four, we can, we can do all this fancy stuff to make our models interpretable, right? We can do monotonically constrained gradient boosting machines or use super sparse linear integer models or something. But none of that's any good if the features in my model are so complex that I can't explain them. And I think one, one thing to watch out for here, especially, is like features that came from deep learning, right? Or features that came from the middle of a deep neural network. So I've put here some uh, feature transformations that I consider to be interpretable. But again, it's just the, the idea here is I can do lots of stuff to get an interpretable model. But if that interpretable model is built on uninterpretable input data, then I've just wasted a lot of time and money. OK. So there, without going into too much detail here, there are interpretability techniques that we would consider to be global. They help me understand my results in general. You know, what are the important variables in general in my model? And then there are explanatory techniques that help me understand, hey, just for this one person, this one piece of equipment, this one patient, this one row of data, what were the drivers of my decision making? And it's really important to use both types of explanatory tools. Because sometimes the, the, the easiest way to explain this is sometimes the complex nonlinear machine learning models just do very weird things. And if all I'm stuck with is a local explanation, and it really doesn't make any sense because in this one case, the model chose to be wrong to get 17 other people right, and I'm sitting here looking at explanations that don't make any sense, I need to be able to fall back to kind of more stable, uh, more well-understood global interpretability techniques. So the local interpretability techniques tend to be newer whereas the global interpretability techniques tend to be older and, and better established and kind of easier to understand where they're coming from. So if you're going to go down this route of trying to interpret a model, I highly suggest that you use both global interpretability techniques. So those would be things like linear regression coefficients or variable importance or partial dependence plots. I would use global techniques and I would use local techniques. And that's where things like Lime and Shapley explanations come in. Okay, so let me save you a lot of trouble. And uh, if you are using tree based, who uses tree based models? Decision tree based models. Good. A lot of people. Very popular kind of model. If you want to explain each and every prediction in your decision tree based model, you should use this new thing called Shapley explanations. Came out last year at NIPS. So I'll just save you a lot of testing and deciding what you should use and testing a bunch of software packages. Just use Sha Shapley explanations. In, in our testing, they've been, the, they've been the most reliable, and then they have theoretical, um, theoretical guarantees around their consistency, which is really nice if you're going before regulators. All right, so if you want to run out of here today and build an, an explainable machine learning model, besides from you know, buying driverless AI, which I've already brought up, uh, you can use the open source package XGBoost, and then in combination with the Shapley explanations that we just mentioned yesterday. I'm, I'm sorry, that I just mentioned last slide. So uh, I probably mentioned them yesterday too, sorry. Uh, in, so what do I mean by monotonic XGBoost? So XGBoost is a gradient boosting package. It's open source. And uh, one thing you can do with this is tell it for any given variable, hey, I only want your predictions 
to increase as age increases. Or hey, I only want your predictions to decrease as age increases. And that element of monotonicity actually really helps with explaining models to people. Because you can say, look, as, as my customer's age goes up, their likelihood to pay their bills is only allowed to go up in this model. It might be a complex relationship, but it's monotonic increasing. So I can combine that kind of constrained model, which is basically easy to explain, with these newer Shapley explanations and using completely free software that you can go download right now, uh, you can have a very explainable machine learning model. And if I was out, you know, not working at a software vendor, working, you know, in, in a commercial vertical, this is what I would be doing. And buying drivers with AI. <laughs> okay. So the last two tips are fairly uh, detailed. But there are things that we've built into our software and things that we like a lot. And we have some open source examples that you can go and try today. Uh, so we like to use these models. The, uh, the picture on the left is called a decision tree surrogate model. And that is a decision tree that's trained on the inputs to a complex system and the output of a complex system. So we're training a model, we're training a simple model to represent a complex model. I train a simple three-level decision tree on the inputs to a machine learning model and the predictions of a machine learning model. And some people in the room are like, yeah, we did this in the 90s. Uh, and so what I can see from this kind of simple three-level model is I can see the important interactions in my data set. I can see what variables are important. The higher up in the tree, the more important the variable is. And then if I combine this sort of approximate overall flow chart that I get from the decision tree surrogate model, if I combine that with another visualization called partial dependence and ICE, I can get a really good understanding of some important interactions in my data set. So it's probably hard to see from where you are, but there's a thick red line on that uh, visualization on the right. And that thick red line represents the average prediction of the model across the ranges of age. What those other lines on the graph are is they're the predictions at certain deciles of the model for one row of the data. So the red line is the average prediction for the entire validation set. The other lines on the, on the visualization are for certain rows in the data set. We call that ice. We call the thick red line partial dependence, and we call the other lines ice. And if you see ice crisscrossing with your partial dependence, it's a good indication of, that there's a strong interaction at play. And so I can use the interactions I see in my decision tree, where variables are above and below each other. I can use that, sort of combine with this visualization where I can see the individual and global behavior. And I can get a really good idea what strong, what strong high dimensional interactions are at play in my machine learning model. OK. <sighs> One last slide. Of course, it's the longest one. So who here has heard of Lime? OK, good, good, good. So for those of you that haven't, you should go try it. You should re go read about it. It was a very seminal paper in machine learning interpretability. Lime stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. And what it, what it does is it tries to build a linear surrogate model to explain regions of a complex response function. And it's sort of become the de facto interpretability technique. And it's a good technique. But there are some caveats to it. And um, the one thing I really like about Lime is that it can tell you when it's not trustworthy. You can look at the fit statistics for that local linear model. And if they're way off, then that's a good in indication that these explanations aren't very trustworthy. Um, Lime can fail. Lime can give you poor explanations, especially if you're trying to use it in a region where the response function that you want to explain is extremely nonlinear. Um, I talked about this in the beginning. Lime is very difficult to deploy, as it was originally prescribed. So we have a deployable uh, version of Lime. And then uh, Wells Fargo just put a paper on archive where they described something called Lime Soup, or, uh, where they where they use a combination of decision trees and local linear models to explain more complex models, very deployable. Um, and this is kind of advanced, but you know, I got to give something for the advanced people in the audience. So one thing to keep in mind with Lime that really, can be really tricky is that the reason codes are an offset from a local linear model intercept. And 
if I'm in a, if I'm in a local region, let's say because I'm, I'm poor, then all of that information might be captured in the intercept of the model and not really show up in the explanations. So that's, that's an important caveat when using Lime. Um, you can try to make Lime behave better by using discretized or binned inputs. I highly recommend that. And then I also highly recommend manually creating interactions that you might think be, are really important in your model. Try those in Lime. Um, and then another trick we like to do at H2O is instead of building one local model, build five local models and kind of take the average of it and see what you can learn across those five folds. So here's some advice about Lime if you're going to try it. And I think it's a good technique and you should try it. We've just been playing around with it and learned a lot about it. OK. So um, I think they brought the books in. They're, where are they? They're in that box. So if you haven't grabbed a book, grab a book. And go to these websites if you want to learn more. And I'm going to stop talking. Thank you very much.